Hello, this is, believe it or not, the final video of my project. So I finally tinkered around and decided I should show my face. Uh, sorry, I couldn't get my little, whatever you call it, straight. I obsessed over that for many minutes, hearing my wife's voice echoing in my head. She's not really here, but I hear her saying, get, make sure you look right, and da da da. But I look the way an artist looks when they have obsessed like a little maniac for the last bunch of days with, I must mention, a, uh, a little dog that's sick. Our McTavish is old and he's now diabetic and he's pretty well blind at this point. Um, so I have to give him insulin injections twice a day and special meals and watch everything. And he's eternally hungry and whatever. Well, I've found a nice balance now of... Um, is CBD oil and I tried I got a THC oil one and I put two drops of THC into a full bottle of the CBD and uh, it's not a major difference he's fully functional he navigates steps and things better than before so it's just enough more for so the CBD activates but anyways uh, so I have McTavish that I've been working with during this so most of the time when i'm working on this just keep this in mind that uh mctavish is uh he's over 20 25 pounds maybe maybe more um a little overweight and i had him in a little doggy watch as a little baby carrier that we use for our smaller dogs and a lot of the times he wants to cuddle up in that and watch well not watch because he can't see but have his head directed towards the pumpkin and just kind of take in the the movements of my body and the heat of my body and stuff and I it's a little hard in the back I try to do it so that he sits on my chair uh, or on my lap so I can sit on a chair and it just takes it off my back but anyways just so you know what has made me look a little scruffy at this moment and all downstairs I've got a massive cleanup to do because I just had to rush I didn't know if I'd get this done at all so uh, I'll give you a little bit of background uh, my name's Damon Rowan Child for those that don't know me uh, most people know me as a tattoo artist, a very uh, alternate tattoo artist. Um, my my artwork is is quite different. My approach is quite different, and I would consider my work. I, I used to shy away from the term, but it is definitely transformative. Uh, but I would call it healing and healing on many different dimensions. Doesn't mean that you get a tattoo for me and instantly the broken arm you had just heals in two days or something. That's ridiculous. Uh, although, who knows, weird things have happened. But it's more uh, deep emotional healing. But when emotional healing happens and spiritual healing happens, uh, other things can shift because those things shifted that might have been holding everything, your paradigm, in place. Um, I use a lot of techniques while I'm tattooing uh, to do this, and those have built up and I've gotten to know them over the years. Uh, one thing I love doing uh, is using a lot of sacred geometry because I feel that sacred geometry is extremely healing and it's all in nature. Therefore, it's all in us too. We're in part of nature. So sacred geometry, I feel, and I've read, So, but my feelings are that uh, there's an extremely healing quality to I was introduced to them with the idea that you, while we were having our introductory course or level one course, um, gosh, that was a while back. I think it was Drunvalo Melchizedek. Gosh, that, oh, that was actually when Toronto had the power failure. It happened right in between this thing where he was doing an angel invocation. Kind of a bit freaky. We went running for candles and everyone was trying to, you know, guide people on the street in their cars and stuff. But anyways, um, I uh, I learned from actually his uh, a different teacher. I didn't have him the first course, and I had him the second one. But I learned from his teacher about some aspect of sacred geometry, and what I retained was how important it was. Even if you have a sacred geometry image in front of you, like a coloring book, to sit there as we were asked to sit and color while we were listening to her talk. She says just absentmindedly color this doesn't matter if it's good just whatever and she says it's going to process on some level in your mind and do 
really amazing things if you do this often. It tunes you into this vibration. Uh, sacred geometry has an extremely harmonizing effect. Uh, so if you're out of harmony, if you feel out of place, uh, out of sorts, sacred geometry tattooed onto you, which is what I tend to do uh, also with tattooing the, the needle, I do only dotting and I feel that it's kind of like the tapping that's now quite the craze and like sort of like acupuncture, but I'm, I do have an acupuncture doll and I do know acupuncturists, but I, well, I call it um, just for lack of a better word, I can call it uh, intuitive acupuncture is sort of one aspect, but it's one small aspect of what I do and how a tattoo can be healing. Uh, I have all these things layered on top of each other. So I work with sacred geometry. I uh, do and acknowledge this kind of a intuitive acupuncture or acupuncture guided by the soul or something. I tell people when they come in, I have, like, I don't, I don't really even want to know what they want till they get in the door. Them telling me what they want is more for them so they can process that so that when they get here, they're a little bit more certain. But when I work with someone, they end up um, quite often changing or subtly changing things according to my suggestions and ideas because I, you know, I've been doing this so long. Uh, how could they get all the same creative ideas that I get? Um, so, you know, it makes me think of my mortgage agent, you know, I have no skill in that area. So Maria, my mortgage agent will blow my mind. Like, I feel like she's a superhero or something. Uh, I really do. Like I cannot comprehend how her mind can think of multi-layered, multi-dimensional, uh, mortgagey stuff, you know, and she, uh, mind blowing. So I guess maybe that I'll, I might come across a little bit alternative to some people. So anyways, that's just a little intro to a little bit about how I work. I also use, I find very important to use music and, and carefully selected music according to the situation. Uh, and I it's sort of subtle and sometimes more direct do resort to um, sort of a psychotherapy uh, with people because they need to process stuff and I especially when I have someone who's had a death in the family or has just overcome uh, an illness themselves uh, yes I do step in I don't pretend I'm a doctor or anything but I do have a lot of uh, perspectives and a lot of understanding based on all my own life's ups and downs and things and I've had a load of people in my chair getting tattoos and they're quite often in the chair for you know, for mostly over six hours, sometimes I've, you know, 12 hour shifts. I shouldn't do those that often. And quite often people come for four or five days in a row. Uh, so it turns it into a whole other process. So that's what I do with my tattooing. And then I just mentioned um, the Nightcrawler, uh, which is the uh, interesting tattoo that I was asked to design for the Nightcrawler, uh, just to, you know, anyone that um, didn't know that we were asked to just do designs uh, also to solve the problem of how do you do black tattoos on blue black skin well I solved that quickly and then I had to win over half the panel who didn't want him to get tattoos he wanted him to be the way he was before and uh, I I solved that in about a minute I had it solved in my head before that actually it was just just something I knew uh, and that worked for them. I won over the panel. Um, they originally wanted a half of a face. I did that. They loved it. They wanted the whole face done. They changed the way the movie was going to go because he was going to have a, like a painted white area here, I guess, to disguise that. So they only needed the top half. And I did that, and they flipped, loved it, wanted the upper torso done, did that, you know, and it just grew more and more. And it's interesting because uh, I requested that Alan Cum Cummings have his um, a plaster cast made of him because I said, you know, I'd love to meet him, hang out with him, but the length of time it's going to take me to design this, I just don't think he's going to want to sit still in the chair. Uh, and I don't think they want to pay him that much. So it'd be very easy for me to do from a plaster cast, which I did. And I, I heard 
unfortunately he had a, a little bit of a panic, uh, which I might do too, especially if it was my first time, you know, having this hardening, um, plaster forming on your face with a little straw that you can breathe out of and your nose is blocked. So I understand that. Anyways, I got it all designed. But while Raven and I were designing it, we said they just want designs. They don't want meaning. Now, this all ties in with what I'm doing here. I'm not just rambling. Uh, they, we want to put meaning into it. That's what we're about. Like, here we are, uh, artists that are all about meaning and in a certain style and approach and how we address our clients and how we treat them. Uh, we like to feed our clients. We find it really important. Uh, a Greek word, uh, phylloxenia. Uh, which is taking in, you know, a stranger into your house like they're your your own. Um, Raven taught me about that being Greek uh, a long time ago. And I love it. I love having my clients over and Raven cooks for them while I'm tattooing them and they stay overnight and so on. It's part of the experience. Um, so it's many dimensions to my tattooing, but the most significant now is I do not pre-draw. I do not do stencils um, I have in the past, but for the last three years, I've basically focused on that which works the best for me and my clients. And I think you and ask any of them, you'll see. Uh, some of them who haven't been to me before get a little nervous because they're not used to that. But when they leave, they the common thing that would be said is, it's not what I thought it would be, but it's more. I just couldn't, I didn't have the capacity to think of it like that. But now that I see it, it is the way I wanted it, but didn't know. So that feels really good, you know, that I'm obviously doing my work correctly or my, my ideas are working well. And in doing this, um, I'll give you another example. Raven used to always say, well, what are you gonna do about the whatever that's coming up? And I say, don't worry, don't worry. I don't know what I'm gonna do, but it'll just come to me when the time is right. And this is how I work. And it's not because I'm lazy, it's because I, I am avoiding pre-planning because that goes into sort of that philosophy thing that you're working in the past and then just regurgitating it. And I want to channel my tattoo or my art. And that's exactly how I've worked on this pumpkin. I, I didn't even plan it until I drove along and found a pumpkin and thought, oh, you know, maybe I'll decorate it. But I was just thinking of a, just a slightly more advanced uh, a jack-o'-lantern like most people would do uh, and I wasn't even sure if I'd do it or not but anyway push comes to shove something happened and I had the time and the determination but not to do a regular one I did a bit of research and there's a whole bunch of stuff and I don't want to go into that too much because that's a big ramble um, but I'll go in lightly um, there's some elements of this pumpkin should I um, wonder how I'm gonna show you the pumpkin oh man you know the problem with this video thing is i can't switch from being on me to going back and turn around to going on the pumpkin and that's annoying because that should be an easy feature anyways um so i've got the sacred geometry worked in so i find the sacred geometry and it's interesting this is the fibonacci sequence and i was just noticing the um dream catchers that nizani made for me um, has pretty well the exact same pattern. So indigenous people used the Fibonacci and knew about the Fibonacci sequence. They may not have used that name long ago. Um, and his healing qualities. Um, I have chose to sort of envelope this pumpkin in a way with these designs. Uh, it's not an easy task to make it fit especially when the pumpkin is not 100% circular. Uh, but I did manage to, it took me a day just of the drawing to, to make it all mathematically fit and work out. So that was done. Now I've been carving. You can see all my previous videos. And uh, so some of the symbolism that came together. I wanted, I read about the lantern in the way it is now. And if you go back into pagan history, these lanterns were still kind of literal in their understanding you know, that the let me backtrack around this time I've, as everyone knows there is the um whether some people say it's halloween november th or october 31st or some people say november 1st is the day of the dead some people have november 2nd is the day that which is 
of course. Coincidentally, my birthday. Um, it was interesting because I was supposed to be born on November 5th and I was named, middle name is Guy, after Guy Fox Day. Uh, and when I was in England as a little kid, I was born there, I saw the Guy Fox Day celebrations and, you know, they'd burn this effigy of, of Guy Fox and they'd have fireworks going off and we'd go around and ask for pennies for the guy. Um, I can't remember now if it was for donations or what it was. Uh, but kind of parallel to the Halloween thing. And then I think when I was four, I moved over to Canada. Noted massive snow. Freaked me out, but it, in a wonderful way. And um, found out that there was this strange holiday. You know, and there were us kids and they came over and said, well, why aren't your kids dressed up? You know, oh, here, just, just throw a pillowcase over each of them and and put a little hood on them or, you know, put some bit of makeup on their eyes and I'll take them out with my kids and they get all this candy and we're looking around going, Canada's cool, man. We get candy and this cool holiday called Halloween. I'll chuck the old Guy Fox thing. I'll trade it for this. No problem. So that's sort of how I started out uh, in my exposure to this holiday. Uh, later, when I was older, I learned that there was this veil, as they called it, between the worlds of the spirits or those that have died and the living uh, fairies elves anything like that depending on the culture and i've always found that interesting and then later getting into astrology uh, some really good astrologers out there online uh, maru matu uh, molly mccord and the leo king show i forgot his actual name those three are excellent um, but and I don't retain a lot of it as much as Raven does. But th this, not just this time of year, like every year, but this time of year now and never quite the same ever, are a whole bunch of levels of I don't know planetary craziness that are causing some really intense shaking up. And I know it because every client I talk to just about gives me their story or a bit of their story, and I know oh, they're going through the ringer too. And it's different for each person. Now, this intense time that you could say, well, this is horrible, but it, no, it's not. What it is, is stuff is being pushed to clear out of your system. Old habits and uh, old patterns and patterns of negativity, things you're afraid of, whatever it is, it has to come up. You have to feel it, really feel it, own it but not get bullied by it or not go, oh, you know, I'm so, such a loser and blah, blah, blah. I, I can't do this anymore. No, you, you need to empower yourself and face it and not be afraid to feel those pains and whatever it is that you're having to feel. Everyone's different. Uh, so it's actually really, really good time of year uh, because it is for release because we're all really being pushed to go through a massive change for the better. We're in old stale times and things aren't working the way they were. Um, so I'm going with it. I finally made my little deal and with myself and just said, okay, I'm going full on. I've had some really difficult times, I won't lie. And some really wonderful times too. But some challenges, holy mackerel. I literally had to listen to those guys, the astrologers, to just make sense of what the hell was going on and and it just, I found it a little more comforting for me to do my work. Uh, so anyways, uh, let me see. What other elements to this do I need to explain? So I had the sacred geometry, the way that I work, and just letting it evolve. So I didn't know what I was doing at each step. I, and then I'd move to the next step, and I'd find out myself. Um, Raven's last question before I did it was, well, how are you going to get the light to shine through? Well, I've done that too. I told her I would. I said, but I don't know how I'm going to do it yet. Um, so the jack-o'-lantern in a Christian overlay mythology was this something jack, I forgot what they called it, you know, wacky old jack, we'll call him. And it seemed like he was drunk all the time and he was a trickster and he just made bad deals, you know, like the worst possible person that just can't get it together and will never get it together, it seemed, and blah, blah, blah. And he made these deals with the devil and, and then he got kicked out of heaven when he died uh, or they wouldn't let him in when he died. and But he had made a deal with the devil. Now imagine this, that he, the devil would not take him into hell. 
So the way the story goes, it sounds like a little children's story to scare them away from things. Um, he roams around because he can't go into heaven or hell. And uh, he is given a little ember from the devil or Satan or whoever uh, to carry around with him. For why? I, I have no idea. I didn't think that the devil did nice things, you know, to help him see his way or something. And so everyone, supposedly according to that myth, casts um, or puts out their jack-o'-lanterns to scare him away. Eh, I don't buy it. I think it's a real lame um, Christian overlay, um, like patchwork even. You can see the seams uh, and some of the tape is peeling off the edges and stuff. But way I look at and now I've read a whole bunch of other more uh, pre-Christian as well. I'm not anti-Christian or anything, but I... I don't care for when anyone just goes and does a stupid little overlay. We'll call it folklore. It's not stupid, but it's it's folklore. It's meant for kids and stuff. But I look into all the old stuff, and I've read a whole bunch of the stories about how the Janko Lantern came to be. And the closest thing that I will go with is that they're put out because of this veil that's so thin between the worlds, and it's to scare away any negative entities or whatever you want to call them. Uh, now, I resonate with that idea, and I also would like to say, and I'm sure most of you would agree with me, there could be these negative entities or whatever manifestation they are outside of us. But you could also say there's a lot of negative entities inside of us if you think of uh, viruses and things like that. Uh, some good bacteria, bad bacteria. Um, I think uh, viruses are way more intelligent than us in some ways. But anyways, uh, aside from things outside us, I look at um, all the emotional stuff and programs and things that have happened to us in the past as our stuff that we need to work with. And I think when these veils are the thinnest, it's the, e the best time and the easiest time in so many ways to... Um, to work with them, to clear them. So this is not to ward off these, we'll call them negative entities, troublesome entities, uh, entities that won't move. They're just in cyclical patterns. They're ingrained in us from childhood or from whenever, some event, some trauma. And uh, that's the problem too with trauma is that uh, it's a very good way to shift how you are and lock you into some different way. The only problem is you don't have much control. So one person has a car accident and recovers and they've seen the light and it's the best thing in the world. Another person, they have PTSD and they, they can't even go outside their door. So that's a problem with trauma um, in that way. But I'm looking at my, my lantern right now as I'm speaking to get ideas of what to say. So... Um, so mine is designed to, using the sacred geometry, I'm using it to uh, harmonize or align me and everyone else, because this is not just to affect me, but it, it is a meditation in doing it, and I encourage everyone to give it a go next Halloween, um, or any time, actually. I don't think it has to be Halloween, but Halloween is the time, uh, or Samhain is the pagan holiday uh, but it doesn't matter. This is recognized by many cultures and many time periods that there is this veil, we'll call it, between these worlds and things can kind of move through that otherwise couldn't. So I don't know, you might have a dream about your dead mother-in-law or something like that and she came to visit you and you're, rather she didn't. Or you could have a great dream about um, your dad that died or something that you did care to see. Um, so... That's the sacred geometry, is to harmonize and bring forth. And also to bring, in harmonizing, is to bring clarity between uh, what it, you, what's coming from in here, your feelings, and what's true to you, and what is just an overlay, what is just a program, but is trying very well, sort of like the matrix, you know, you got to find the glitch in the program. Sometimes we're just not in the right headspace to be able to, especially under pressure, to be able to tell the difference between feeling and thinking too much. And when you think too much, 
you're just playing most likely the old program, which is going to convince you to keep it. So this is the time to do it. My jack-o'-lantern, if you want to keep calling it that, uh, but my kind of soul realignment uh, lantern is here to send out an energy and an intention, not just to myself, but to everyone, hopefully to really bring in an awesome 2020. Uh, but it's also to, uh, to affect people in a way it, with this harmonizing quality that they will actually have a much better clarity on how to discern what is crap speaking to them within themselves and what is their soul or their heart or their gut, uh, you know, and how to trust it. So it should intensify the ability to read your gut your heart brain because uh, you you're really you have a gut brain a heart brain and then your I don't know, head brain and it's the heart and gut that are they're finding out now are way more important to listen to and the head should be secretary but doesn't always do a good job and that's all this ego stuff too so we're trying to bring in these better qualities that that know how to align us with nature and using the sacred geometry for that um, I read some more, which is really interesting. And this is an element of my, my, uh, just making sure my light's still on. I'm talking too long. My, um, my lantern. And that, that I read was about the bonfire, which links with this, you know, the glow, another version at different times of year is the big bonfire. And especially at this time of year. So the bonfire is not like bon as in the French word for good, bon. Uh, it is bone in English. Uh, this is, I looked it up on the etymological dictionary online, a few of them just to double check. And it is bone fire. And it was basically uh, an offering of gratitude, just like the harvest, Thanksgiving. Um, there were bones from their harvest. You know, they had, if they had eaten well, there were bones left over from. Uh, whether it was animals they hunted or whether it was animals they farmed. And those bones, they burned, and that was the bone fire. And it was a very sacred fire because uh, it was giving thanks and it was tuning in with, because of this veil, with your ancestors and those that had gone before. And it was a very special time. So I wanted to combine the two. So I did, uh, rather than burning bones in the pumpkin, now I'm going to bring it over to you. Now I hope does turn this time but no i don't think it does so i'm gonna have to turn this around this is really no you know what i'm gonna do i'm gonna make another video to follow this one okay so i did all my explaining uh so without being able to show it to you right off the bat my candle is made with it's a bone that i found in my what my dogs had chewed on and they'd hollowed out all the marrow so i poured the candle into that centerpiece uh, so video right after this is going to be the actual show and tell. Thank you for listening.